Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles and I wanted to go ahead and bring to you an interview that I did with Jim Harolds at one of his programs called Ghost Insights and this was right when I had just released uh, my first book which is Haunted History of the Old West Wicked Ladies and the Bad Hombres They Loved which is kind of like a historical slash ghost book about the old frontier um, and uh, the all of it is sourced from true stories and I think you're going to enjoy it and by the way if you the book is uh, if you're interested in it it's available at my website at miamighostchronicles.com but anyway I want to go ahead and share this interview that I did with uh, the wonderful Jim Harold concerning this book and all the really interesting uh, hauntings and stories attached to not only these uh, shady ladies, but the gunmen, the, the lawman, the miners, all these people that were the cast of characters that uh, pushed out west, uh, usually around the 1850s, trying to find fame, fortune, and sometimes love. And a lot of times, that isn't exactly what they found. Eras with ghosts. And one era that I don't think gets uh, enough attention is the Old West. And boy, this this sounds like an interesting one. The book is Haunted History of the Old West's Wicked Ladies and the Bad Hombres. They loved our guest today is Marlene Pardo. She is the author of the book and very well steeped in the paranormal. She is a freelance writer who holds a Master of Science degree in Human Behavior and Health. She's a certified master hypnotist and considers herself a subconscious behaviorist. She is the founder of Miami Ghost Chronicles and has been a paranormal researcher since the 1990s. She's worked mainly with groups in Florida, but has also assisted other organizations and clients across the country. She's the producer of the Internet show Stories of the Supernatural, in which she interviews authors and experts and any who have witnessed the unexplained. She's also appeared on the television show Paranormal Survivor. We're glad to have her on the show today. Marlene, welcome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here today with you. Good to have you. Now, here is the question. Why did you decide that uh, you wanted to put your attention on the Old West uh, when it comes to ghostly matters? Well, to be honest with you, initially, I did it for all the romanticized reasons that everybody, I think, you know, when you watch the old Westerns, it's because, uh, you know, the the gunfights and, you know, uh, all the, especially, you know, Hollywood produces all these versions of, you know, here you had people, ordinary people, in other words, who went out there and just made their lives sometimes that didn't end so well, but basically they live life on their own terms. And I think that's what attracted me about, you know, what we call the old West, which is like that time period right after the civil war and maybe like up to the 1920s. Now the women of the old West, to me, it would seem to me that uh, some of them uh, were maybe some of the first feminists because uh, you had to be a survivor to, to live in the old West. Talk to us just in general, before we get to the haunted part, what mm -hmm. the, the, the women that you, you followed in the old West, what were they like? Were they kind of like uh, they took the bull by the horns and probably uh, pardon the expression, didn't take any crap. <laughs> well, you know what? And, and this is the thing. I mean, and I did a lot of research because uh, even when I wrote the book, it, I consider it historical nonfiction. In other words, you you know, you always have versions of what turns out really not to be truthful, but I tried to do as much research as I could. That's why I found out a lot about, like what you said, who were the women that ended up there, uh, you know, what they called the soil doves. And some of them, most of them, I'm going to say their backgrounds were maybe they really didn't come from uh, – wealthy families. Some of them ended up being abandoned, uh, let's say by a husband. Uh, others were lured to frontier towns with promise of a, repu uh, a reputable position. Turns out that wasn't it. Uh, but bottom line, yeah. And later on, you find out it wasn't as glamorous as people think, but they did offer women back then when there was no form of really good employment. Um, to ha to live life on their own terms and gave them enough money for lack of a better word where they had some independence um 
And usually the ones that were a little bit smarter eventually put money together and were able to get out of the lifestyle. And unfortunately, the ones that kind of like ran into trouble was like, even like today, they had problems with addiction or, you know, a husband or a boyfriend that, you know, you know, d- uh, domestic troubles, all the above. But yeah, absolutely. Especially the madams, um, they, they were, they were entrepreneurs, uh, in the only business that a lot of times they could actually be entrepreneurs in, which was brothels. Well, that's so the, the book, are we, are you focusing on specifically um, ladies of the night, as they say? Well, um, you know, some of these ladies, um, some of them did live to an old age uh, and some of them, and they, they became well known either one because they died tragically, but they were well known in the town. A lot of them, uh, in other words, made the papers or we hear about them today because they were involved with what I call the bad hombres, which were gunslingers like Wyatt Earp, you know, or any of the men that became famous for whatever reason. And that's how they figure in the story and how, why we hear about them today. But yes, when I when I did the research, there was nameless women out there uh, that you n- never hear about now. and. Uh, you know, not even in movies or programs or books that were out there, uh, either pulling themselves up by the bootstraps and just making the best with what they could and, or ending, uh, dying under very, very tragic circumstances, which is what leads into the haunting part of the book, which is a lot of the, the lifestyles and the deaths is the staple of or the underpinnings of intelligent hauntings which is tragedy. So you just brought something up and I was planning on asking you about this. So the hauntings that you cover in your book, uh, you know, some people talk about hauntings being residual or maybe mm-hmm. like a replay, just kind of a psychic emotional imprint that, that replays itself. But these are, these are actually what you would call intelligent hauntings. Yes. Yes. And you know, and uh, it, it residual hauntings, a lot of times, I would say most of the times it's either sounds or smells or something that's very repetitive or heard at the same time. You know, every once in a while you'll actually get sometimes even an apparition, but usually you could tell there's no interaction and it's just, and sometimes it's a certain month or a certain anniversary, but there's no interaction. You could tell uh, if you're not really scared because most people like, you know, they hear somebody, let's say going up and down the stairs. It's like, that's it. I'm out of here. But the intelligent hauntings is when you have, um, whether you want to call it the soul or the spirit of a human being who is trapped between, you know, being l- alive on the earth plane and having gone into the afterlife. So they're kind of stuck in this in-between place. And sometimes they know they're dead and other times they don't. Um, some of them just don't want to go on because there's just something that's anchoring them here, which is, um, could be, uh, Somebody killed me and let's say the killer was never brought to justice or they did away with me and they buried me in the backyard, you know, under that tree or, um, you know, some of them, they missed the bus when it came to the part of I am dead and they just they just stuck there. And that's the ones that tried the interaction, whatever it might be, with the living that occupy that space of maybe there was a house there once or if not, the house is still there. And like I said, um, you know, you get a lot of places, you know, historically that are known for certain ghosts. But a lot of times I tell, you know, I've told people there's a cast of characters as far as uh, apparitions or phantoms that you might never really truly know who they are unless somehow you get a name and then you can do a research. But because there were so many people that lived out in those times and it's not like now where everything is uh, recorded, for lack of a better word. Um, and as a matter of fact, Jim, this is one of the things about these ladies was that uh, I would say 99.9% of them all changed their names, their birth names ah, to either something totally different, okay, or a variation of what their birth name was, um, mainly for two reasons. One, they didn't want to bring shame to their family of origin. And two, they were afraid of that word of what they were doing would get back to their families 
which, by the way, back then, even after death, um, if they ever did find, let's say, the family, whether it was a husband or parents, because a lot of these women went in there into um, this work when they were really, really young. Even then, the families, uh, I, I ran across stories where the, f- the family said, we don't want the body. Wow. We don't care. Wow. Or if they would bury them, they would just bury them, uh, let's say, in a cemetery. Because, you know, back then, they would ship the body back to wherever, and they wouldn't even buy a headstone. Like, in other words, this was a very great shame for the family, um, which is another reason sometimes where, where you might have hauntings because, you know, that spirit feels like the ultimate rejection even from your family, even after death, in other words. Now, um, that that's a question. You, you, you talked about how they changed names and so forth, and obviously a lot of time has passed. How mm-hmm. did you go about researching this and finding subjects for the book? Um, I went uh, back then. That's another thing, mostly through newspaper clippings, really old newspaper clippings. And even then, it's very time consuming because obviously um, the newspapers were really careful about what they printed with anything having to do with either prostitutions or brothels or, you know, they had a lot of these euphemisms for women of the night, you know, soiled doves, you know, whatever, upstairs girls. But every once in a while, they would make the papers either because they were fined, they were arrested and fined, or they had some client that came into the brothel and beat everybody up, and then they all appeared in court. And then you will find like a little snippet like way in the back of the newspaper, um, you know, saying so-and-so came before the judge and this is what happened. But it's very time-consuming. And like I said, a lot of the things just never were never documented. What kind of euphemisms did they use when they talked about these ladies? Uh, well, um, I want to say some of the most common, especially in the Old West, were soiled doves. You had upstairs girls. You had uh, the the uh, painted women or painted ladies, um, uh, uh, daughters of misery. I mean, they they came up with some really colorful <laughs> ways of um, describing women without actually – because even the you, you know, saying that word of prostitute, even that was right. like – you know, you did not say that in, in polite society. Uh, and uh, they had a, a lot of um, – I mean, I remember – in one clip, I looked at they were describing the madam of a brothel who died. This was in St. Louis, and they called her a Cyprian. And I, I looked that up, and I, and I found out that that was a very common uh, word used to describe prostitutes. And what's really unusual, Jim, is believe it or not, this lady, when she died, she was in her 30s. And her... Um, her funeral was attended the whole block where her street was located with the house. It, it, it was impassable because there was so much traffic and so many people attended the funeral. And that's the one thing I want to say. Some of these madams that were known for kind of doing good works, especially if they had some money, they kind of always forgotten and forgiven when they died. Ah, interesting. And everybody turned out to their funerals. And you know, it was a big thing. And then you had the other girls, which um, were lesser known. And they were lucky if they were even allowed to get buried in the regular cemetery. Wow. A lot of times they would I'll not allow it. that. They would either make them get buried in the pauper's grave or, you know, where the where I call the indesirables, the, fringe, the people on the fringes of society were allowed to be buried. So it depends, you know, uh, how well they were known. And usually if – who their clients were, for lack of a better word. In other words, if you had an upscale brothel and your clients were maybe the mayor or the businessmen, you know, and you had gone ahead and given money, let's say, to charity and things like that, chances are that they would allow like a a nice funeral to take place and you get buried in the regular churchyard cemetery. So in terms of in terms of the haunted piece of it, talk to us about mm-hmm. that because I think that's interesting. These ladies uh, coming back or or never leaving. Uh, how'd you find out about all that? And, and talk to us about the haunted history piece. Okay, well, for example, one of the ones that I wrote about, which was um, this was 
a lot of these uh, frontiers towns, they usually sprang out like this, like I said, was usually after the Civil War. And a lot of these towns sprung up either because of mining. They would find like some type of, uh, you know, gold or anything like that. Or the railroad, as it was pushing west, these towns would spring up. And this, you usually had an area of the town called the Tenderloin. And this is where you would have all your bars and your brothels and all that other unsavory stuff would, would take place there. So in some cases, some of the houses are still standing. For example, there's one in Cripple Creek, Colorado, where a famous madam, her name was Pearl DeVere, which, by the way, was not her real name. And I found out that for some reason, uh, several ladies of the night took that name. But she was one of the most famous. And her original brothel, which she built like uh, in the 1890s, is still standing. And uh, she ended up uh, committing suicide by uh, taking an overdose of morphine, which, by the way, was very common back then because uh, they would use it to sleep. And uh, there was a lot of suicides by morphine, especially of the women. And she said to haunt. And she, by the way, she was another one that had uh, a big parade uh, funeral and everything, and they allowed her to get buried in the regular char chard in the cemetery with the regular people. But she said to haunt her brothel, which is a two story brothel. Uh, also, I mean, there's several. As a matter of fact, Cripple Creek has kept a lot of their historic buildings uh, intact because, of course, uh, after the 1920s, I think in World War One, and the mining kind of died down. The town kind of like downsized, but luckily. They've kept their buildings. And um, one of the most interesting stories that I came across as far as haunted, which had nothing, by the way, to do with the spirit of a prostitute, was they had a – the Undertakers there mm -hmm. was a place by the name of – I believe it was Lampman, uh, Lampman or Fairley Brothers. And they had brought in – the body of what they thought was they called it they ended up calling this the thing uh, huh. this it turned out was the body of a miner who had been crushed in a very bad accident in one of the mines and they thought he was dead and it turned out he wasn't dead oh my but goodness the from the description of the newspaper his eyelids were missing he was he, he was and what happened was he they had laid him out, and all of a sudden he came back to life. Well, not came back to life. It's just that he had never been dead. They just thought he was dead. But anyway, of course, eventually this poor man died, like within the hour, being brought to the mortuary. But then the people in the mortuary kept seeing him, and they called it the thing because it was so horrible to see. And accordingly, I mean, they tried blessings and everything because this was just not an ordinary dead person that maybe they had handled uh, it just looked so horrible because he appeared the way he had died when he was crushed in that mining accident, so, uh, you know, which is, again, um, a lot of the haunted um, history that swirls around some of these towns, if they're still in existence. Some of them have become ghost towns. Is It wasn't only the women, you know, or the brothels. It was whatever people were doing, whether it was the miners or you had like the gunslingers. This was the old West <laughs> people. It was incredible. People like killed each other um, very easily. Uh, there was, um, and that's why sometimes they situated these tenderloins, like on the outskirts of the regular town. Uh, and uh, the same thing. You had a lot of uh, revenge killings. Uh, for example, uh, there's the Chisholm Trail that was, you know, when they were driving the cattle up from Texas up to like Abilene, Kansas, anywhere where the railroad would stop and they could load their cattle on there. And of course, these became huge, uh, like, ta well, towns and on the outskirts where they had the railroads, you would have these tenderloin areas. And it was the cowboys from Texas, they were so rowdy that a lot of these towns did not like them. And sometimes you had shootouts, and then the family would remember, and 10 years later, they would catch up with this person and kill them. It was like a vendetta was very common uh, out there. Um, and there was another example. Um, there was a town in Texas where one of these ladies had originated from. And what had happened was, I believe it was in Belton, Texas. 
And uh, this town has sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War. And after the Civil War, they kind of got punished because they had they took away all the public officials. Bottom line, uh, it wasn't not that that there were that many people, but basically the outlaws were playing havoc with all the landowners, the people that were living out there. And one time a group of their vigilantes, but the men that were out there, they broke into jail took out nine of these outlaws and just shot them and then buried them oh my gosh. in the churchyard because they weren't getting protection. They weren't getting protection from whoever was the government there. This was right after the Civil War, which was kind of crazy. But And, uh, you know, and it says that because things were so crazy as far as law enforcement compared to what we know as of today was that despite what they were doing, that none of them, of course, were brought to trial for anything like that was that outlaw gave this area a wide berth. They did not go near there because it was well known that if you ended up getting arrested, you know, you might get some of that, you know, citizen justice. Right, right. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The lifestyle out there was very, you know, life could end very tragically and violently for anybody. Now, um... In terms of sightings today, are there a lot of sightings today in, in places that survive? Well, uh, I'll tell you what. There, uh, like I said, luckily in Cripple Creek, a lot of their original historical portions are still there. Some of them have been remade into what they call hotel slash casinos. And a lot of, a lot of their buildings there still have, um, uh, they still some retain their old names and they have they they have very well known hauntings. Okay, like I said, including a uh, Pearl DeVere's uh, old brothel named the Old Homestead, which is still there. I believe they're a museum now. Uh, there's a uh, Deadwood up in uh in the what they call the Dakota Territories. That was another town that was lawless, violent, and they have uh a lot of uh, the old structures, which, by the way, uh, that area of Deadwood where they had, you know, the 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 way it would work is you would have the saloon downstairs and then you would have the brothel a lot of times upstairs. Other times you just had a freestanding house that was just a brothel. But uh, a lot of those buildings up in uh, in Deadwood are still there and they had they they had. Uh, prostitution they're like i believe into the 70s or 80s so sometimes i know i've I've spoken to groups that work that area they have a lot of reports of hauntings there it's just difficult to tell sometimes how old the haunting is as far as what the origin is but that's, that's another city that you could go to that absolutely you're gonna come across um there's uh, also in San Diego they have um well now it's called it was before like bef- around the turn of the century and up to like 1912 their tenderloin was called the Stingery District and now it's called the Gas Lamp District which is very beautiful I've been there it's very nice it's the older part of the city but this again was the area uh in old San Diego where they would keep you know the as a matter of fact if you were a lady of the night there was a certain street that you could not go beyond and you, you would have like let's say messengers on bicycles deliver food and booze and whatever you needed to you but uh, a lot of those buildings they demolished them but you still have i believe it's the grand horton hotel that is on the site of what used to be um an old brothel called the canary cottage and this was run by a madam by the name of ida bailey again i tried really hard i could not find what her true name was and she died of old age, and she they, it was well known when she became older, she was basically destitute, and mm-hmm. she would be given food and you know by the by the locals and things like that. And like I say, she didn't do what I saw some of these madams do, which is either invest in a stash of loot or in a husband. Because that was another thing, Jim. In the old West, um, it was not as common as people think. But if you were one of these girls. And you ended up getting married. That was it. You could slap on the resp- the respectability sticker. You know? And back then, it was uh, impolite to ask somebody about their past. So if you could get married, then all would be forgotten. 
And she did she did neither, this uh, lady, Ida Bailey, because she ended up destitute walking around the streets. And supposedly where her brothel was, mm-hmm. uh, the Grand Horton, which is, uh, I've seen it's a very nice hotel over there in San Diego. And there's reports of hauntings in certain rooms. Also, there was um, a story having to do with a gambler. One of two versions that he either he was murdered because of not paying a debt or cheating or he killed himself. I was never able to find that uh, an exact information. And truth be told, that's another uh, cast of characters that would end up uh, dying violently, which were gamblers. Gambling, uh, a lot of these gunslingers uh, and lawmen are both because they, they also did a lot of uh, gambling. They either owned... Uh, a saloon, or they would have gaming tables inside the saloons. It was like all, and all of these were circumstances where you could end up on the wrong side of either a rope or a gun easily. Yeah, I could see if uh, if somebody lost in a game of cards, they would accuse somebody of cheating, and then boom, <laughs> that would be it. I yeah, guess it, it, uh, you know, and, then, and of course <laughs> there was a lot of you know there was a lot of uh, liquor of alcohol. This was it was like. Uh, and and this was the thing, people, which to me attracted me also to that pe- time period was because you had everybody going in there to make money. And you had uh, people that were very rough and basic. And then you had just people that were just trying to make a living and just going out there because there would be such a huge flood of people. And let's say if you were not a miner, you made money by selling either equipment for the miners or you would put up a hotel or food. That was another thing. Yeah. Uh, everybody went out there, just make a living, make money. Yeah. That kind of thing. And, and so people made it and others didn't. <laughs> it was, and uh, it, a lot of perseverance. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, you saw the best and the worst of the human spirit out there. It, it, the thing about the miners and the mining, you know, they said many times people, when they went for the gold rush, the people that made the, the most money were the ones selling the the pans and the pickaxes and all the different things to uh, to do it. Yes. They made more money than the miners. It reminds me of podcasting. <laughs> you know, all these well, companies. Well, <laughs> it was, it's, it's, it's exactly, that's, that's the thing. People like kind of like when they had like these, uh, that they would find these loads out there. There are people from back east, which everything was a lot more like I, what I say, pragmatic. And everybody was some people, some men especially, which, by the way, was another thing as to why some of these brothels were set up. Because in some of these towns, it was like a 25 to 1 ratio. It was like one woman for every 25 men or more. So they knew they were going to make their money. Uh, but, yeah, they dropped everything and they went out there. Like you said, you can't mine unless you have mining equipment. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, to clarify my comments, like podcasters, the, the people making probably right now the most money on podcasting are people that sell mixers and microphones and all sure. that stuff. Yeah. Sure, yeah, hey. and because what could you do? I mean, you can't, you know, what you you. You can't uh, let's do a podcast. Let's say on your phone. It's- yeah, my, yes, uh, do it on my uh, uh, tin can. Uh, exactly. But any, <laughs> although when I listen to my original shows back in '05, it kind of sounds like they were recorded with that. But anyway, <laughs> um, so um, when these uh, these ladies are sighted, and when there is a haunted experience, do they what? Does their personality uh, tend to be? Is it all over the map? Are they playful? Are they? angry uh what do you hear a lot of them um usually sometimes they're recognizable because they've they've some of them especially they were a little bit well known there was a picture in other words it was a picture that was especially if it was towards the 1890s where photography was a little bit more common so they have actual photographs to say hey that was the lady i saw um mostly a lot of them I would say are basically seen doing what they were doing, either staring out of windows, they're seen out of certain rooms. Um, There was one lady where this was also in Cripple Creek where she was, she, uh, she's, and she's, the the story was this, there's a couple, they have separated. I, he apparently takes up with this lady who had just arrived in Cripple Creek, his wife somehow or other finds out that he's in this room with this lady. 
shows up at the room and the one that opens the door is this prostitute as late of the night in a negligee and he's trying to hide somewhere in the closet the wife turns around shoots her in the heart down the road she gets acquitted they say that she in a moment of passion she lost her marbles <laughs> she she got acquitted and she gets together again with her husband and they finish bringing up their three kids that lady that was killed uh, they, which is, by the way, this would happen. There was no money to bury her. So that, uh, that, uh, those morticians, the ones that I told you about that had that, that minor that came back to life, they put her on a slab of ice with a sheet over her and they put her like by one of these big windows and kind of charge people to see her. And she's been sighted quite a few times, like in a bloody sheet and just seen. And that in and of itself is like people run in the other direction. Uh, so yeah, sometimes they're seen in like, not in their regular dress. They're seen that, you know, for her, maybe this was like the ultimate, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm lying on a, on a sh- sheet of ice because they see her, like what they say, it looks like a wet sheet on top, you know, wrapped right. around her. Right. So it's, it's usually from what I've seen is. Uh, and a lot of these places, they say that, especially the the ones where they've got some type of casinos that they've established casinos, let's say on the first floor, you'll have stories of a lot of people being touched, um, uh, people in the kitchen, things banging around. Um, they they believe it or not, some of these hotels they even have children sightings because many times when there was outbreaks of any type of disease, they would act. Some of these places would actually uh, be used as quarantine centers because back then, you know, people did what they had to do with whatever was happening. So they would have deaths, you know, that were tied to establishments that really had nothing to do with customers. They were, let's say if there was a, a yellow fever epidemic, for example, and they served as a quarantine station and you had certain people die there. And a lot of them, sometimes you do have children and they think that, that's tied to when it was used for that purpose. Uh, but um, everybody I know thinks of, oh, you know, are these spirits of these, you know, uh, ladies of the night, you know, do they come on to you? To be, I really didn't hear that much. Most of them is that they're still seen a lot of times doing or being in the room that they were attached to, that they were most familiar with. Uh or going about their daily activities, being seen on the stairs, uh, being seen dressed a certain way that identifies them, mm-hmm. uh, things of that nature. Um, I really didn't hear that much of them, like, let's say, being at their at their grave site, you know, because everybody thinks of the cemetery. Uh, most of them are usually seen where they lived at. Where, And I can imagine, especially, let's say, if you are a madam and you – pulled enough money together to put a brothel up. This probably meant a lot to you. This was right. your livelihood. So I could see why some of them would be attached to where they lived and worked at versus where they were buried at. That, so uh, That would make sense to me. And it's an interesting topic. I love the fact that it's something different because after 12 years of doing these shows, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to see something a little bit different. This certainly is that. The book is Haunted History of the Old West's wicked ladies and the bad hombres they loved and our guest has been marlene pardo marlene where can people find the book and also more information about everything else you do well they could go to um they could go to either marlenepardo.com or miamighostchronicles.com or they can go to amazon uh and they can find the book there okay uh if uh if they order it from uh miamighostchronicles.com 